Hello and welcome everyone to this video. Today I'm going to be going through a game which is very very special to me because actually just yesterday I arrived home from the 44th Chess Olympiad and at the Chess Olympiad I did fairly well and in round 5 I even beat an IM and I think we should just start and go through the game. So the IM I played against is uh, IM Marina Brunello from Italy and she played 1E4 against me. Now, I am so professional that I will actually just flip the board right here while you're watching. Um, those of you who know me, you know I'm a big, huge fan, big, huge, yes, indeed, fan of the French defense. But in this game, I decided to play c5. Knight f3, d6, and then she goes for bishop b5 check. Here, black has a few different options. Black can play bishop d7 or black can play knight d7. I decided to play knight d7. And here she played bishop a4 and... I was surprised. I was surprised that she played this move. I thought that she would play something different. That's what I had in my preparations. So from here I had to uh, be on my own pretty much. And I decided to play a6. This is not the most precise move, but for me this was something that I was fairly familiar with. Something where I could transpose into different lines. Um, but soon after I played it, I realized hmm, maybe this wasn't the right way to go. But my idea is uh, very simple. I'm threatening b5, c4. So that if my opponent decides to castle here, well, she is actually losing the bishop like this. Um, so instead she has to play the move c4. And now we can get a few different structures. I play knight f6, you play knight c3, g6, castles, bishop g7, h3. This is actually a fairly normal move. Um, it's stopping any knight g4, uh, bishop g4 at some point. Um, and it's just getting a little bit of luft for the king. I castled and here she pretty much has two options. The first one is that she can go for, uh, for d4. And after I take, she can take back with the knight. And now we have this Maroxy kind of uh, structure um, with the pawns in e4 and c4. Um, or she can play as she did in the game. The d4 lines, that would just be, a, be another game. It isn't better or worse than what she played, but she played d3. Um, and now in this position, uh, you see that she opened for the bishop, it can get out. And... I could also play in a few different ways here. You know, I can play rook b8 to prepare some uh, some b5. I can play b6 to get the bishop out via b7. Um, I can maybe move this knight to prepare f5. But instead, I went for the move e5. What I'm doing now is that I'm just stopping any future d4 ideas to come on the board. Um, and I'm also still trying to get somewhat into my preparation and, you know, just getting into the structures and the ideas and the plans that I'm familiar with. Um, so if you ask the computer, objectively, this isn't a, a very good move, but the subtleties and the differences, they're, they're quite tough to, uh, to understand why. Um, so I don't think we should go into too much detail on that. Instead, um, when I played e5, she played bishop e3, she's developing her pieces, and now I played knight d8. The plan of knight d8 is actually uh, fairly simple. One of the ideas is that I want to go f5. The other idea is that I want to go knight c7, which is firstly preparing to play b5, but it's also preparing to go to e6 and into this nice d4 square, which is on the board. She played queen d2, she's looking down this diagonal, maybe wanting to trade bishops at some point, but also these pawns are on dark square, so this bishop isn't very good at this moment, so for the time being she doesn't want to trade it. Um, in this position the best move was to just play the move knight c7, as I explained before, to e6 and, uh, and d4. Um, but instead I decided to go for the move f5 immediately, putting pressure in the center. Once again, subtle subtle nuances and uh, differences and everything um, that I don't think that we should go too much into. Um, but knight c7 first was more precise, but after she took on uh, on f5, it wasn't that uh, huge of a problem for me. She should have probably started with the move uh, bishop to g5 here, um, and then I have to put something in on f6. I would probably have gone for, for the bishop here, um, but I could also put one of the knights on f6, either the d or the e. But the problem is that I always have to look out for these knight d5 moves when this knight on d5 is very strong. Um, but she decided to trade first. 
I took back with the G pawn in this position. Taking back with the rook isn't exactly what I what I want here. Um, these squares around my king, they're very weakened and I don't really get to create the counterplay that I want to get when I take with the pawn, which is preparing, a, well, it is threatening f4 at the moment, which would lock in this bishop on e3. So in this position, she decided to go for bishop g5, which was also an idea from before. Um, and here I actually made quite a huge mistake. I played bishop f6, actually thinking it was kind of the only move in the position. Um, what I had missed here was that after knight d5, oops, sorry, uh, here I thought that if she played knight d5, I would take on g5, she takes back, I take the queen, she takes back, and now I wanted to play my knight here to f6. But the problem for me in this position is that after knight e7 check, king aj then f4, my structure here in the center um, is actually... Oof. <laughs> my structure is uh, is really getting messed up. I'm way behind in development here. And this would have been a tragic way for the game to continue for me. Um, so I actually completely uh, missed this. And after knight d5, I have to play the move king h8. Um, where now my king side doesn't look very well. And she has a few different ways that she can continue to put more pressure on me. Um... She also missed this. Instead, she played rook a to e8. And now after knight c7, I don't have the same problems because the knight is protecting the square here on d5. So suddenly, you know, even though I didn't know I had messed up, I could uh, I could breathe. Um, she played the move bishop to, uh, to h6, attacking my rook here on f8. And I played the move bishop to g7. Now, wanting to trade bishops, if she takes, I will take back with the king. Um, and my king actually isn't very unsafe here on g7 because it can always go back to h8. And my pieces there are very good at uh, getting into play here. Um, instead, she played knight h2. What she's doing is that she really wants to play the move f4 here. Um, of course, she can't play the move f4 now as the bishop on h6 is hanging. But this was also the idea that I showed before, that she really wants to attack my center um and try to make it collapse so i played knight e6 i said she can't play f4 because the bishop on h6 is hanging so she took on g7 first king takes g7 f4 now is met by knight takes f4 so instead she played knight e2 also now trying to get the move f4 in once again we want to stop f4 and we of course do this by playing f4 ourselves now she can't play f4 in any way whatsoever um, she played the knight back to c3, trying to look at the weak, lighter squares uh, in the center. But her maneuvering here is quite slow um, and also fairly passive. This bishop on a4 is out of play. It has to get back to d1 at some point. And I can just continue improving my position with knight f6. She played bishop d1 and I played rook b8 here. My idea with rook b8 was that she probably wanted the bishop on f3 at some point and... Then if I wanted to move my bishop on c8, I had to, you know, protect the pawn on b7 anyway. For example, let's say I play king h8 here, um, which is actually a better move. She played bishop f3. Now I can't really move this bishop because the pawn on b7 is hanging. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, let me just protect my pawn. And then I will always uh, be able to move the bishop on c8 afterwards. Knight g4, I put my knight in the center. She went back, not really knowing what to do, being afraid of trading the wrong pieces. And now I could get my bishop out to f5. As you can see, the black position is just improving all the time. I have my pieces in the center and my king actually isn't unsafe because of this idea of going to h8. Um, and she would have no way of attacking it either way. She played knight f3, king h8. Now she sees that I have some ideas here. I have the idea of rook g8 and taking on h3. So she just started by playing the king to h2. Queen d7, moving my last piece that haven't been moved. And now the rooks, they can finally see each other. She played b3, I played uh, rook to g8, and she took on d4. In this position, it was actually better to play the move rook to g1, which seems very strange, but we will see in just a second why this move is better. So she took on d4, I took back, and she moved the knight. And 
I would very much suggest that you try to pause the video now and figure out what you would play if it were your turn to move. Um, I didn't find it during the game. It is very, very difficult um, to spot. So if you can spot it, it's very, very well done. Now that I have talked a little bit, maybe you've paused the video. Let's keep going. Here I was calculating the move. Rook takes G2 check. During the game, I couldn't make it work, but we will see why it actually works. So it's a check she will take with the king. I now take the pawn on h3 with another check and she goes to h2. It was around here that I arrived in my variations when I was trying to calculate this, but it wasn't easy to see the incredible move from black here. Bishop to g2. Just putting the bishop on pre again and if she takes it, there's rook g8 check. King f3 is met by queen g4 checkmate. Um, and if she moves to h2, then queen g7 is threatening both checkmate on g2 and on h6. So let's just show one of them here. And after bishop h5, this is checkmate. Um, so after bishop g2, she can't take the bishop. And I'm also threatening queen h3 to h1 checkmate. But she can go back to g1. Now queen h3 in this position... I'm threatening queen h1 checkmate. Um, so she has to play f3. And now, you know, black has sacrificed the whole rook. But we just play rook g8 here. If she tries to run, I can just take the rook. Because if she takes back... I know this is a long variation, but keep following me here. Queen h4 check, king e2, rook g2, rook f2. And finally, queen takes f2 is a checkmate. Um... So it actually turns out that after rook takes g2, there's no way to avoid checkmate. It's just forced. Um, I didn't find it during the game. Uh, <laughs> but I thought it was absolutely beautiful when I arrived back uh, at my hotel room and saw it. Instead, I played queen f7 trying to improve my pieces. Um, she played bishop f3, queen g6, rook d1. And now, you know, preparing this beautiful doubling on the g-file. She played queen e2 and uh, queen h6. And after c5, I actually started to panicking a little bit because I didn't have a lot of time. I was getting a little bit frustrated that I couldn't find a forced win because I was like, okay, you have to look at all my pieces. They're so well developed. My center is strong. Her knight is on b1. What's that doing there? Um, the journey of this knight so far has been c3, e2, c3, b1. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so... I was getting a little bit frustrated and I was like, now she's attacking my center. So what if my center start what if my center suddenly starts to collapse? Um But there's no reason to to worry here. In this position, I was looking at the move rook to g3. And funnily enough, this actually also works. If she takes the rook, f takes uh, g3, king h1. This is what I was looking at during the game. I was looking at bishop takes h3. Rook g2 e1. And my calculation wasn't going uh, very well at this point. Because I was only looking at bishop takes g2. Um, but after king takes g2, queen h2, king f1. There's actually no checkmate for black here. And I've just sacrificed a rook and a piece. Um, but if you can, I would suggest that you try to find the mate. Mate in three. So if you haven't found it yet, remember to pause the video. Because I will show it now. Moving the bishop. Bishop g4 is stopping all this uh, bishop h5 stuff because king g1, oops, king h2, queen h2, king f1, and queen h1. This is, a, this is a checkmate. And I didn't see this during the game because I just simply forgot that the bishop, uh, the bishop could retreat instead of going forward. These moves, they can be quite tricky uh, sometimes. Instead, I played queen to h4 with the idea of uh, knight g4, putting pressure on the f2 pawn. So she moved the rook to h1. Um, and yeah, once again, I was calculating all these moves, all these variations, and I just couldn't make anything work. Which was a little bit sad. Rook takes g2. I'm not going to make you calculate it again, but rook takes g2. This is insane. It actually works. Uh, bishop takes g2, bishop takes h3, threatening, rook takes g2, checkmate, and if she takes on h3, rook g3. When I got home and I saw this, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. This actually works. That's insane. 
Um, the point is that if she takes the rook on g3, queen takes g3 is checkmate. And if she goes, uh, sorry, if she goes to f1 with the queen, knight g4. And it's a checkmate again. I was like, no way. This is just not true. <laughs> um, yeah, so insane, insane, insane uh, variations. Rook takes g2 work, worked again. You know, I just decided to take on c5. I was like, you know, I'm not going into any of these crazy variations because I can't figure out if it works or if it doesn't work. Um, she played knight d2, and yes, you guessed it, rook takes g2 is once again checkmating. But, <laughs> but I was like, nope, I'm just going to play bishop g4. Um, I didn't have a lot of time on my clock. I think I had uh, a maximum of, uh, of 10 minutes, maybe. She played rook uh, h2 f1. And... Um, I don't know if you want to see another beautiful tactic here, but I will show it to you anyway. Bishop takes f3 is beautiful. Uh, if she takes with the knight, g2 is hanging and it's going to be checkmate very, very soon. Um, so she has to take with the queen here. And after queen takes e4. She has to protect g2. Remember, she has to protect g2. Um, knight takes e4. Knight g4 check. The king has to move. And knight e5. That was why we moved the e4 pawn, the e5 pawn to e4, because we want the knight to go to e5. And now she can't protect g2 lo lo any longer. I was like, whoa. This is insane. Um, instead, instead, in this position, I played queen h5, rook g1, queen h4, uh, rook f1, queen h5, rook g1. I repeated the position a few times. I needed to get an extra time on my clock. Um, and, you know, we were also playing on a team. And I was looking around. I was looking at my teammates. We were the underdogs in this match. We were by far the underdogs. But we had won one game. We were ahead 1-0. I was looking to my side. I was like, Oof, what is going on in these boards? If I make a draw now, we might get a 2-2 result. But I'm not sure we will. And I didn't want to be the person getting blamed for not playing on in this position. Um, so I was like, okay, you know what? I'm playing a strong player, but if I ever want to get better at chess, playing on is what it is. You're never going to win a game by making a draw. It's as simple as that. I played knight d5. This was a huge mistake. Um, <laughs> let's, let's just forget about this being a huge mistake. She uh, she took on g4, which was the right move. I took on g4 and she had to play queen f3. She had to play queen f3, keeping control over the light squares here. But she played rook d to e1. I had one and a half minute on my clock. One and a half minute. And I was looking, this is move 40. I just need to make one move. One move, and then I get my extra 30 seconds, okay? And I was like, hmm, if I play my rook back to uh if I play my rook back to g5 here, queen takes h5, rook takes h5. You know. This this I'm not gonna lose this. I will at least make a draw. I can push for a win. Um and the team might might be doing well. Um because Suddenly, one of our players had made a draw. It was one and a half to a half. A draw would get the 2-2 at this point. So I was looking. I was like, oh, I can do this. And then we will at least get 2-2. But then suddenly, after having spent 20 seconds, I spot another move. I, I have like a little more than one minute on my clock. And I spot the move F3. Oops. I spot the move F3 in this position. And I'm like... When I play this move, she will have 30 minutes to calculate what I have missed when I play this move. Let's just take one of... The first variation I saw was g takes f3, queen takes h3, king takes h3, knight f4 check, king h2 and rook h4. Checkmate. This was the first variation I spotted. So she couldn't play that. The next variation I spotted was knight takes f3. And after knight takes f3, in this position, I can also play knight f4. And after knight f4, I'm threatening the queen on a... Um, wait, I'm confused. Why isn't knight... 
takes f3 in my... Aha! Sorry, sorry. Knight f3, rook takes g2. I got confused. This was another line that I was thinking of. Knight f3, rook takes g2. I'm a structured streamer. Everything's, um... Everything's prepared. Rook takes g2. Rook takes g2. Rook takes g2. King takes g2. Knight f4. And I'm picking up the queen. This was the next variation that I spotted. So I was like, okay. She has two moves. Two moves left. The next is queen takes f3. Queen takes f3. Knight f4. And now I'm threatening all sorts of unpleasanties. Like taking on g2. Maybe taking on h3 at some point. Um, when she plays king h1, I didn't see this far, but I can actually play queen h6, and now I'm threatening on g2, um, and this was complete, this was complete chaos, and I thought, okay, she probably has to take with the queen, that's the most critical, and I saw that she could take on e5, uh, sorry, after f3, I saw that she could take on e5, queen e5, rook e5, and rook g2. And then I stopped my variation here. I didn't want to look further than that because my time was ticking down and I was like, <sighs> okay, I'll just make a decision. I went F3. I got up from the board and I pretty much just ran away, you know, because I was just too scared that I had missed something in my variations and that, you know, at some point uh, with her 30 minutes to calculate, I would get destroyed and then my teammates would be like, Ellen, what are you doing? Um, but it turns out f3 is the only completely winning move. I'm gonna give myself a little bit of credit here. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I was like, my heart was just pounding and I was so nervous. Um, she, she took a little bit of time, but not too much. And then she played the move queen takes e5, making my life a little bit easier. Because now I knew that I would get um, a very good endgame. Queen e5, rook e5, rook g2, rook g2. And here I could take with both the pawn and I could also take with the rook on g2. Um, I decided to take with the rook here, king h1, rook takes f2. And now we got into a rook end game. Rook end games are, of course, not easy. But here I do have, uh, I do have quite a few pawns extra too. If I haven't calculated, um, if I haven't counted wrong, she has four. And I have uh, six. Now she has to play king g1 because if she takes on c5, rook d1 check, king h2 and f2, the pawn will promote on f1. Um, so she plays king g1 first. I took on a2, she took on c5, I went back to d2. Check, king moves, check, king moves and takes on b7. Now, good technique in a rook and game is very, very important here. If I took on d3, at this moment, she could play the move king f2 and my pawns are kind of blocked. My rook can't go back to d2 because the pawn on f3 is hanging. Um, and there is actually pretty much only uh, two winning moves in this game, uh, in this position here. Um, and you know, this this king f2 actually annoyed me, uh, annoyed me quite a bit, but then I spotted the move king g5. I said to her, you know what, take my pawn if you want to because... Nothing in rook and games is more important than activity. You know, give a pawn, but get some activity all the way. Um, so I said, I don't care about this pawn. You can take it if you want to. She didn't want it. My plan worked. Like, get the king forward. And I didn't even drop a pawn because she played the move rook to f7. I took the pawn on d3 now. And now she could play the move king f2. But then the pawn on b3 was also hanging because the pawn on b7 was no longer there. Um, which brings us back to the point that um, a little bit earlier in this position, b4 was actually the most precise move. Because then uh, in these variations after king g5... When she takes on d3, the pawn on b3 is no longer hanging. Um, but those are just some subtleties that I quickly wanted to mention. Okay, so I took on d3 and I took on b3. Now she decided to take the pawn on h7, but I moved my pawn to a5. You know, I have three passed pawns. Some of them must be pushed. She went to d7. I had to protect my pawn with rook d3. Rook a7, and here, you know, I say... What's the most important in an endgame? Pawns or activity? 
and it is activity of course so i played the move a4 with the point that when she takes the pawn on f4 my king can go forward and that she doesn't have any checks on this rank here um and i'm threatening the move rook to d2 so if she wants to do anything she either has to go passive with her rook or uh, allow, let's say she goes to a7, she allows her king to be cut off on the back rank. Um, and this is not an easy decision that she has to make here. She decided to go passive, but after rook d1, this is what I want to do. I want to go to h1, I want to go to h2. Rook b2, rook h1, rook b8. She couldn't allow this check, which would pick up the rook on b2. Um, I gave a check, now her king is cut off. Pawns must be pushed. And rook f8, king e3, rook e8, king d2. And this is the time where you have to know your rook end games. You have to know your um, your end games in general and good technique. Because king c2 and king d1. Now is the time when we are getting into a very, very well-known position. Um, because we got here. And... Uh, and here and this is a position that you get in almost every end game book <sighs> pause the video think for a few seconds and um see if you can find the most precise move in this position i will talk uh talk a little bit more maybe you have come back at this time rook f5 this is the Luciana position. We want to build a bridge. And my opponent, she actually just... Uh, she just resigned here. Um, and the point is that I'm threatening to get the king out. Let's say she makes a move like king g3. I play king e2. I'm threatening to, to get a queen here. Um, and if she checks, I go here. She checks, I go here. I'm threatening to put the rook down and take a queen. And if she get, gives more checks... Then I can put the rook in between. Um, and now I've built the bridge and the pawn will go down. So after I played the move rook to f5, she didn't want to play anymore. I had won the game. The team had won two and a half. Uh, a half. We still had one game going. She also made a draw, so we didn't even lose any games in the match. And... Um, it was just a great day for Team Denmark. A uh, great day for me. So I hope that you like the game. If you want to subscribe, leave a comment, leave any feedback, I would be very, very happy to hear. I'm sorry that the video got a little bit long. That was not on purpose. I tried to keep it short. But it was a long game. 69 moves. Couldn't be better. I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.